Five Fall Into Adventure by Enid Blyton. Georgina was at the station to meet her cousins. Timmy, her dog, was with her, his long tail wagging eagerly. He knew quite well they had come to meet Julian, Dick and Anne, and he was glad. It was much more fun when the five were all together. Here comes the train, Timmy, said George. Nobody called her Georgina, because she wouldn't answer if they did. She looked like a boy with her short curly hair and her jeans and her open neck shirt. The door swung open almost before the train had stopped. Out came a big boy and helped down a small girl. Then came another boy, not quite as tall as the first one. They stepped down onto the platform with their bags. Julian! Dick! Anne! Your train's late! We thought you were never coming! Hello, George! Get down, Timmy! Don't eat me! Only those three bags? Well, we haven't come for long. Only a fortnight. Still, it's better than nothing. It's lovely to have you again. Mother's looking forward to seeing you all. I bet Uncle Quentin isn't. Father's in quite a good temper. You know he's been to America with Mother lecturing. He's such a brilliant scientist. I expect they were really impressed. Will Uncle Quentin be at home all the time we're staying with you? No, Mother and Father are going away for a tour of Spain, so we'll be on our own. There won't be any time for adventures these holes. They walked down the lane to Kirin Cottage. Red poppies danced along the way, and in the distance the sea shone as blue as cornflowers. Soon they were all sitting round the tea table at Kirin Cottage with their Aunt Fanny. Where's Uncle Quentin? In his study. He knows it's tea time. Look here, Fanny. See what they put in this paper? The very thing I gave orders was not to be put in. The idiot! The Quentin! I whatever's the matter? Now we'll get the place full of reporters wanting to know all about my new ideas. See what they've said. This eminent scientist conducts all his experiments at his home, Curing Cottage. Here are his stack of notebooks, to which are now added two more. Fruits of his visit to America. I tell you, Fanny, we'll have hordes of reporters down here. No, we shan't, dear. And anyway, we're soon off to Spain. Look, can't you say a word of welcome to Julian, Dick and Anne? Well, here you all are again. Do you think you can hold the fort for me while I'm away with your aunt? With Timmy's help, I'll put up a notice. Beware, very fierce dog. <coughs> when are you and Mother going to Spain? Tomorrow. You might have warned me it was tomorrow. Quentin, I've told you heaps of times we leave on September the 3rd. The children will have a lovely two weeks on their own. Nothing can possibly happen. Nothing can possibly happen? Aunt Fanny was wrong, of course. Anything could happen when the five were left on their own. It really was very difficult to get Uncle Quentin off the next day. The taxi arrived and hooted outside the gate. Aunt Fanny rapped at the study door. The study door was flung open and Uncle Quentin stood in the doorway. His wife made a dart at him and dragged him down the hall. In no time, he was sitting in the taxi, clutching his dispatch case. Goodbye, dears. Don't get into any mischief. Poor mother. It's always like this when they go for a holiday. You simply have to make excuses for anyone with a brain like his. Well, we're on our own. Except for Cook. Good old Joan. Come on, let's go down to the beach and have a bathe. Soon they were all down on the sand. They found a good place and scraped out comfortable holes to sit in. Timmy scraped his own. Two people came slowly along the beach. A boy and a man. And what a ragamuffin the boy looked. He wore torn, dirty jeans and a filthy jersey. The man looked even worse. He slouched as he came and dragged one foot. He had a straggly moustache 
and mean, clever little eyes that raked the beach up and down. The two were obviously looking for anything that had been cast up by the tide. The two walked along the beach and then back. Then, to the children's horror, they made a beeline for where they were lying in their sandy holes and sat down close beside them. Timmy growled. The boy took no notice of Timmy's growling, but the man looked uneasy. The children got up and went for a bathe. When they got back, the man had gone, but the boy was still there, sitting in George's hole. George bent down and pulled the boy roughly out of the hole. He was up in a trice. His fists clenched. George clenched hers too. Now, George, if there's any fighting to be done, I'll do it. Now, you clear off. We don't want you here. The boy hit out with his right fist and caught Dick unexpectedly on the jawbone. Dick looked astounded. He hit out too and sent the tousle-headed boy flying. Hitting someone smaller than yourself. I'll fight that first boy, but I won't fight you. You can't fight him. He's a girl. You can't fight girls. Says you. Well, you look here. I'm a girl too, so I can fight her, all right, can't I? George and the ragamuffin stood scowling at one another, each with fists clenched. They looked so astonishingly alike, with their short, curly hair, brown, freckled faces, and fierce expressions. That Julian suddenly roared with laughter. He pushed them firmly apart. Fighting forbidden. Clear off. Do you hear me? Go on. Off with you. <laughs> She's a girl, all right. She's got some spunk though. Facing up to me like that. Well, that's the last we'll see of her. But he was wrong. It wasn't. The five curled in their holes once more, and apart from a trip back to the cottage for a delicious lunch Joan had prepared, they stayed all day. They were all very tired when they went to bed that night. Julian volunteered to lock up, and Joan was happy to let him. She knew that he wouldn't leave a single window unfastened. That is, except for the little window in the pantry, which she had told him was swollen and wouldn't shut properly. As she said, it was too small for anyone to get through anyway. Nobody stayed awake for more than five seconds. In George's room, which he was sharing with Anne, Timmy gave a little grunt and settled down, his head on George's feet. It was dark outside that night. There was no sound to be heard but the wind in the trees and the distant surge of the sea. Then why did Timmy wake up? Why did he prick up his ears and lie there listening? He slid off the bed as quietly as a cat. Down the stairs he went. Timmy stood and listened in the hall, and then he stiffened from head to tail. Something was climbing up the wall of the house. Upstairs in her bed. Anne suddenly woke up. She was thirsty and thought she'd get a drink of water. She felt for her torch and switched it on. The light fell on the window first, and Anne saw something that gave her a terrible shock. She screamed loudly. George woke up at once. Timmy came bounding up the stairs. Listen, I can hear someone running quickly down the path. Come on, Timmy, downstairs with you and after them. Get him, Timmy! What was that dreadful face like, Anne? It had nasty, gleaming eyes. Oh, I was frightened. Never mind, Anne. It was a tramp, I expect. He found the doors and windows downstairs fastened, and shinned up the ivy to see if he could enter by way of a bedroom. Timmy will get him. That's sir. But Timmy didn't get him. He came back after a time with his tail down. They all went back to bed again. Julian didn't go to sleep for some time. He was worried. 
The boldness of the burglar climbing up to a bedroom window showed that he was determined to get in somehow. The next day was warm and fine. Joan had slept all through the disturbance, and Julian said they wouldn't tell her in case she wanted to send a telegram to Uncle Quentin or something. She made them up a splendid picnic, and the five went back to the beach. The little ragamuffin girl was down on the beach again. She was alone. The children settled themselves by some rocks, and while Dick read, Anne looked for sea anemones, and Julian sketched. George lay back and stroked Timmy. Suddenly, something landed on George's middle and made her jump. She sat up, and so did Timmy. Something else hit George on the back of the neck. It was a damson stone. Julian laughed at George's expression until another damson stone caught him neatly behind his ear. A helpless giggle came from behind a rock some way behind and above them. Behind one of the rocks sat the ragamuffin girl. Her pockets were full of damsons. She sat up when she saw George and grinned. What do you mean by throwing those stones at us? I wasn't throwing them. I was spitting them. Bet I can spit stones further than any of you. Right. If you win, I'll buy you an ice cream. If I do, you can clear off. See? Yes, but I'll win. I'll be judge. Ladies first. I say, that was a good one. Now you, Dick. Hmm, not so good. Afraid she's won. You owe me an ice cream. I'll buy you an ice cream. Don't worry. There's an ice cream man. I'll get them. I say, I didn't give you that bruise on your chin, did I? Yes, I don't mind. I've had plenty worse ones from Dad. I'm sorry I hit you. What's your name? Joe. But that's a boy's name. So's George. Isn't she ever going? I'll go when I want to. <coughs> I like that dog. Don't touch my dog. He doesn't like you either. Oh, but he does. I can make your dog come to me easy as anything. Try. He won't go to you. Joe didn't move. She began to make a whining noise down in her throat. <coughs> Timmy pricked up his ears. He walked over to Joe and licked the girl's face. She sat up at once and put her arms round Timmy's neck. Come here, Timmy. See, I can do that to any dog. How can you? I don't know. I reckon it's in the family. My mother was in the circus, and she trained dogs for the ring. We had dozens. I love them all. Where is your mother? She died. I left the circus with my dad. He was an acrobat till he hurt his foot. We've got a caravan. Where is your father? Gone off to meet somebody. Can I stay with you until my dad comes back? No, we don't want you. Don't you think she could stay and share our picnic? After all, she can't help being dirty. It's all right, I'm going. There's my dad. What an extraordinary girl. I don't feel we've seen the last of her yet. That night, Anne began to look rather scared as darkness fell, remembering the face at the window. Julian kept reassuring her that all would be well, and to make doubly sure, he fastened all the windows upstairs as well as down, except the tiny pantry window that wouldn't shut. Anne and George went to bed. Julian let Timmy out for his last walk and settled down to read his book. Timmy was out for so long that Julian finished his book and went to the front door to call him in. At last, Timmy came, wagging his tail feebly. He went upstairs, climbed onto George's bed, and sighed heavily. Julian woke once, thinking he heard something fall. But hearing Timmy gently snoring through the open door, he lay down, his mind at rest. If it had really been a noise... Timmy would have heard it. Julian heard nothing more till he was awakened by loud screams from Joan downstairs. He leapt out of bed and rushed down, followed by Dick. Oh, look at this. The master's study turned upside down. Those drawers ransacked. The safe's open too. I say, 
Someone's been searching for something pretty thoroughly. How did he get in? Let's check the doors and windows. Right. You do down here. I'll go upstairs. Jill! Jill, there's something wrong with Timmy. He won't wake up. He's ill, Julian. No, he's not. He's been doped. That's why he was so long outside last night. Somebody gave him some meat or something with dope in. Oh, Julian, will he be all right? Yes. He's not poisoned, only drugged. Come and see your father's study. Oh, gosh. What a mess. They were after his two special books of American notes, I'm sure. Father said that any other country in the world would be glad to have those. We'd better call the police. The police were very, very thorough. The children got tired of them long before lunchtime. The sergeant interviewed each of the children, and the constable went over the study bit by bit. The thing that puzzled everyone, the police included, was how did the thieves get in? They stood and looked at the pantry window for some time, and concluded that someone very small might just get through. At their request, Anne, the smallest, tried. But she stuck fast, even before she got halfway through, and Julian had to pull hard to get her down again. None of the children could tell the police what had been stolen. Julian told them about the two valuable notebooks, but couldn't be sure that they had gone, because they'd no idea what they contained, or what they looked like. Nor could George tell the police how to get in touch with her parents, only that she expected to hear from them in a day or two when they'd settled in. After lunch, the children went down to the beach, and had a lovely time out in George's boat. They went halfway to Kirin Island, and bathed from the boat, diving in and having swimming races. Timmy, fully recovered, joined in. They got back to the cottage about six o'clock, completely tired out by the exciting happenings of the day. At nine o'clock, Dick stood up wearily. I'm off to bed. Anne, why don't you go? You look exhausted. Yes, I will. Coming, George? I'm going to take Timmy out for his last walk. If you want to go to bed, I'll lock up the front door, do you? Oh, right. I'll go up in a minute. Don't forget to put up the chain too, George. He left the front door ajar and went upstairs, feeling sleepy. He got into bed quietly and lay awake, listening for George. When he was half asleep, he heard the front door shut. There she is, he thought, and turned over to go to sleep. But it wasn't George. Her bed was empty all that night, and nobody knew, not even Anne. George and Timmy didn't come back. In the morning, Anne was woken by Dick calling the girls to get up and go for a bathe. Anne sat up yawning. Her eyes went to George's bed. It was empty. It was all neat and tidy, as if it had just been made. Anne slipped into her bathing costume and ran to join the boys. George has gone out already. I expect she woke early and took Timmy. Yes, the door isn't locked or bolted. George must have undone it and then just pulled it gently too. She may have gone fishing in her boat. They looked out to sea when they got to the beach. There was a boat far out with what looked like two people in it fishing. They guessed it must be George and Timmy. Dick waved, but the boat was too far away and nobody waved back. After a bracing swim, the three chased one another up and down the beach, and then, glowing and very hungry, went back to breakfast. Nobody worried about George at all. After breakfast, Anne stayed to help Joan make the beds and Dick and Julian went to do the shopping. On their way back, the boys met Ragamuffin Joe walking along the beach. Hello, Joe. Hello. What's the matter? You're crying. N nothing. Where's Anne? Anne's at home. And George is out in that boat with Timmy, fishing. Oh. Hey, don't go off. What's wrong with you this morning? Where did you get that bruise? That was me dad. He's gone off and left me, taken the caravan and all. 
I wanted to go too, but he wouldn't let me. He pushed me down the steps. But surely your father is coming back. Is the caravan your only home? Yes, we've always lived in a caravan. Mum did too when she was alive. But how are you going to live? Dad said Jake would give me money to buy food, but only if I do what he tells me. I don't like Jake. Who's Jake? Jake's a gypsy fella. What will he tell you to do? Oh, well, there's things we do that folks like you don't. I hope he gives me some money today. I'm hungry. Here, Joe. Here's some biscuits. Tuck into these. Where is this Jake fellow? Somewhere about. He'll find me when he wants me. I've got to stay on the beach, Dad said. The boys got up to go, worried about this little ragamuffin. But what could they do? Nothing except feed her and give her money. George was still not home by lunchtime, and Julian began to feel anxious. He went to look for George's boat, and there it was, high on the boat beach. George had not been out in it at all. He ran back to Kirin Cottage and the others. They agreed to wait till tea time, and then, if she was not back, they would decide what they must do. Tea time came, but no George and no Timmy. Then they heard someone pattering up the garden path. It was Joe with a note. Julian opened the front door. Joe silently gave him a plain envelope, which Julian tore open. As he read it, Joe turned to go, but Julian put out his hand and caught hold of her firmly. Dick, hold on to Joe. Better take her indoors. Let me go. I only brought that note. Go on. Stop squealing. You must come indoors. Get off. Listen to this. It's unbelievable. We want the second notebook, the one with the figures in, and we mean to have it. Find it and put it under the last stone on the crazy paving path at the bottom of the garden. Put it there tonight. We have got the girl and the dog. We will set them free when we have got what we want from you. If you tell the police, neither the girl nor the dog will come back. The house will be watched to see that nobody leaves it to warn the police. The telephone wires are cut. When it is dark, Put the lights on in the front room, and all three of you sit there with the maid Joan, so that we can keep a watch on you. Let the big boy leave the house at eleven o'clock, shining a torch, and put the notebook where we said. He must then go back to the lighted room. You will hear a hoot like an owl when we have collected it. The girl and the dog will then be returned. Julian, George can't have come back from a walk with Timmy last night. Yes, someone was lying in wait. Who gave you the note, Joe? A, a man. What sort of man? He was tall and had a long beard and a long nose, and he spoke foreign. Joe, tell us truly anything you know. Serve that George girl right. She's cruel and unkind. I wouldn't tell you anything, not even if I knew. You do know something. Let me go. That fella gave me the note, and that's all I know. Let her go. I thought there might be some good in her, but there isn't. No connection. The wires have been cut. This is all crazy. It can't be true. But it is. Julian, do you know what notebook they want? I've no idea. Nor have I. And it's impossible to search for it. The safe's been mended, and the police have the key. Well, that's that then. Should I slip out and warn the police? No, I think these people mean business. It would be terrible if anything happened to George. Does anyone come to the house this evening? Any tradesman, for instance? Yes, of course. The paper boy comes, but perhaps it would be risky to give him a note. Listen, I've got it. I know the paper boy. We'll have the door open when he comes and yank him inside. 
I'll go out immediately with his cap on and his satchel of papers, jump on his bike and ride away. I'll come back when it's dark and hide to watch who comes for the notebook and follow him. Good idea, Dick. Now, about this notebook. We'd better get some kind of book and wrap it up. Go and hunt out a book, Anne. I'll be looking out for the newspaper boy. Sid the paper boy was most amazed to find himself yanked quickly through the front door by Julian. He was even more amazed to find his very lurid check cap snatched off his head and his bag of papers torn from his shoulder. He watched Dick stride out, leap on the bike and go sailing off up the lane. Sid was not very bright and Julian easily convinced him that it was all a joke. Altogether, Sid had a wonderful evening. A smasher of a supper, then a game of snap in the sitting room, sitting round a table in the window with Julian, Joan, who'd been told the whole story by Julian, and Anne. At eleven o'clock, Julian left to put the parcel under the stone at the bottom of the garden. He was back in the lighted sitting room in under two minutes. An outbreak of owls hooting loudly made them all jump. Julian glanced at Joan and Anne, and they nodded. They guessed it was the signal to tell them the parcel had been collected. Now they could get rid of Sid and wait for Dick. Sid ran all the way home, and when he got there, his bicycle was by the front gate, complete with check cap and paper bag. And that, he decided, was a bit of all right. And now, what had happened to Dick? He delivered the rest of the papers and then went down to the village where he left Sid's things outside his house. Then he went into the cinema until it was dark and he could safely creep back to Kirin Cottage. It was a dark night and cloudy. He debated where to hide, then made a quick decision. He climbed an oak tree that spread its broad branches over the path and set himself to wait patiently. As the church clock began to chime the hour at eleven, the kitchen door opened and Dick saw Julian. He had the parcel under his arm. He saw Julian go swiftly down the path, scrabble about, then drop the big stone back into its place and return to the house. And now Dick could hardly breathe. Who would come for the parcel? He listened, stiff with excitement. Then he heard the slightest sound. The parcel was being collected. Whoever had the parcel was now going off with it. Dick dropped quietly down. There was a shadow moving down the field path to the stile and into the lane beyond. A perfect fusillade of owl hoots came to Dick's startled ears. The signal that the parcel had been collected. The shadow went on again. Dick was about to follow when he heard the sound of voices. He crouched in the shadow of the gate when suddenly a car in the field started up its engine, switched on its lights, and moved to the gate. Dick could see only one man in the car. Had the one who had collected the parcel been left behind? If so, Dick had better be careful. He heard a sniff, then a shadow passed through the gate in the direction of Kirin Cottage. In a trice, Dick was after it, over the stile, across the field, through the hedge, until it went up the path and peered through a darkened window. Dick considered the shadowy figure. It didn't look big. One that Dick could tackle and bring to the ground and yell for Julian. He pounced, and his victim went down at once. How he fought! Dick yelled for Julian, who heard and tore out at once. It wasn't long before they had the struggling figure firmly in their grips and dragging it, wailing to the door. Good gracious! No, it couldn't be Joe! But it was! When they dragged her inside, she collapsed completely. Anne and Joan looked on in amazement. Put her upstairs to bed. She's in an awful state now. What a wild cat! See how she's bitten me! 
I didn't know it was you, Dick. I wouldn't have bitten you like that. You're a double-dealing little wildcat, pretending you know nothing about the man who gave you the note, and all the time you're in with them. I'm not in with them. Don't tell lies. I was up in the tree when you came and followed you to the car. You came back here to steal again, I suppose. No, I didn't. I came back to tell you I'll take you to where George was. Look here. This matters a lot to us. Do you know where George is? Yes. And will you take us there? Yes, I will. One o'clock in the morning. Julian, we can't do any more tonight. Yes, you're right, Joan. There's a couch in my room. She can bed down there. But she's going to have a bath first. In half an hour's time, Joe was tucked up on the couch, perfectly clean, with a basin of steaming bread and milk on a tray in front of her. Joan called to Julian and Dick that Joe wanted to say something to them. Joe told them the part she had played in the recent events, how she had got through the little pantry window and let the thieves in, and watched them ransack the study. She confessed to them how she had doped Timmy so that he slept through the robbery. Finally, when persuaded by Dick in his kindest voice, she told them that George and Timmy had been kidnapped by her father and Jake shut in the caravan and taken to a secret place in the middle of Raven's Wood, which she promised to show them in the morning. Joan was the only one in the household who woke up reasonably early the next morning. At nine o'clock, when everyone had finished breakfast, Julian questioned Joe. Now, what about taking us to where your father's caravan is? You're sure you know the way? Of course I do. Right, look at this map. That's Kirin, and here's a place called Raven's Wood. Is that the place you mean? I don't know. The one I mean's a real wood. I don't know anything about yours on this map. Julian, maps are wasted on her. I don't expect she's ever seen one. I just know the way I have to go. Where's the other boy? I want to see him. She's just crazy on Dick. Oh, here he is now. Hello, Joe. Ready to take us travelling? Better go at night. Oh, no. We're going now. Jake might see us. Yes, he might. Well... You go a long way ahead and we'll follow. At last they set off, taking the meal Joan had packed them. Jo slipped out the back way and made her way out to the lane. The others followed steadily. Then suddenly a dark figure strode out from the hedge and stood in front of Jo. She screamed and tried to dodge away, but the man caught hold of her and pulled her into the hedge. Jake, he was watching out for her. Now what do we do? See if we can get a sight of them. Come on. Not a sign. They've just disappeared. Let's tell the police now. No. Let's go to Raven's Wood ourselves. We know where it is. Yes, I think we will. Quick march. They went on up the lane and came out eventually onto a road. After a few yards, they came to a bus stop and found that a bus was due in five minutes that would take them to Raven's Market, quite near to Raven's Wood. Everyone got out at the market and the bus conductor pointed out the way to the wood to Julian. The three of them set off down the hill into the valley. They came to the wood and a clearing where there was a little gypsy camp. Three dirty-looking caravans stood together with their doors open. Julian took a quick look inside them. No George here. I wish I knew exactly where to go. Can't we ask if anyone knows if Joe's caravan is anywhere about? We don't know her father's name. 
Joe said their horse was called Blackie. Yes, I'd forgotten the horse. Julian went up to an old woman and asked her politely if she knew if there were a caravan in the wood drawn by a horse called Blackie. The old woman did know and pointed the way that Simmy, Joe's father, had taken his caravan a day or two before. Julian went back to the others and led them along a rutted path, just wide enough for a caravan to go down. After a time, the wood became thicker and the path faded out with only the ruts of the caravan wheels to guide them. Dick proposed that he should go on in front and warn the others if he heard or saw anything suspicious, and Julian agreed. Dick went on ahead. Suddenly he stopped and lifted up his hand in warning. He had seen the caravan. Julian told Anne to wait and went on quietly to join Dick. The caravan was small and appeared quite deserted. The boys watched intently for a few minutes. There was absolutely no sound or movement in the tiny clearing. Dick, this is our chance. We'll creep over to the caravan, attract George's attention, and get her out as soon as we can. Timmy, too. Funny he doesn't bark. They ran quietly to the caravan, and Julian peered through the dirty window. It was too dark to see anything at all. Julian called George's name. There was no answer. Perhaps George was asleep, or drugged, and Timmy too. The boys went quietly round the caravan to the door at the back. Julian frowned and knocked gently on the door. Not a movement from inside. He tried the handle. It turned easily, and the door opened. Dick, it's not locked. Come on, let's go in. Empty. All this way for nothing. They've taken George somewhere else. We're done now, Dick. We haven't a clue where to go next. Just a sec. Julian, look here, on the wall. Isn't that George's writing? Red Tower. Red Tower. What does that mean? Is it George's writing? Yes, I think so. But why should she write that? Do you suppose that's where they've taken her to? She might have heard them saying something and scribbled it down quickly. It must be a house with a red tower. Well, we'd better get back now and tell the police. The boys went to where Anne was waiting. Anxious to get back, they started down the path, following the wheel ruts as before. It suddenly grew very dark indeed and heavy rain began to fall. They hurried to a little clearing off the path and sheltered under a clump of bushes until the storm passed. Soon the rain stopped and the wood grew just a little lighter. With Dick leading the way, they tried to find the wheel rut path again, but it wasn't long before they realised they were lost. Julian decided the only thing to do was to try and make their way as best they could in one direction and hope that eventually they would find a way out of the wood. They went on and on for about two or three hours, and then Anne stumbled and fell, quite exhausted. Dick looked at his watch and whistled. It was almost three o'clock. They were all tired and hungry. They ate everything that Joan had packed for them, and then Anne fell asleep. The boys talked softly together, and decided that when Anne woke, they would have another go, and also do a bit of yelling. If they hadn't found their way by the time darkness fell, they would have to bed down for the night. And so it was. When darkness came, they were still lost, and hoarse from shouting. In silence, they pulled Bracken from an open space and piled it under a sheltering bush and settled down. Anne in the middle, Julian on one side, and Dick on the other. Anne immediately fell asleep, and Dick soon after. Julian lay awake for a while, worrying, but at last he too dozed off. He awoke very suddenly with a jump. He heard the hoot of an owl. There was a rustling going on somewhere. 
some much bigger animal was about. It came nearer. It came right over him. Something caught hold of his arm. Then he got the surprise of his life. The animal spoke. Julian, it's me! Joe? Joe! What on earth are you doing here? You're surprised to see me, aren't you? I got caught by Jake. He dragged me off to the cottage he lives in and locked me up. I broke a window and got out. How did you find us? Well, first I went to the caravan, but nobody was there. Not even George. Where is George? Do you know? No, I don't. Dad's taken us somewhere else. How did you find us here? That was easy. I can follow anybody's trail. Ma, you did wander round, didn't you? Yes, we did. We found something written on the caravan wall. We think we know where George has been taken. It's a place called Red Tower. Do you know it? There's no place called Red Tower. It's a man. His name is Tower and he's got red hair, so he's called Red Tower. See? Will you tell us about Red Tower and take us to where he lives? All right. I'm tired. I'll show you the way out in the morning. Then I'll take you to Red's. But you won't like Red. He's a beast. She would say nothing more, so they all settled down and were soon asleep. Jo woke first. She woke up the others and they all sat up, feeling stiff, dirty and hungry. Jo led the way immediately, taking them her way back to Kirin Cottage. Joan was extremely thankful to see them and had almost cried with relief when she'd seen them walking up the front path. She left them in no doubt how worried she'd been and then bustled about preparing a huge breakfast for them all. After breakfast, they all had a bath, even Joe after a threat from Joan, and settled down for a conference. About this fellow, Red Tower. Who is he, Joe? What do you know about him? Not much. He's rich and he talks strange. He gets fellas like Dad and Jake to do his dirty work for him. What dirty work? Oh, stealing and such. Dad doesn't tell me much. Where does he live? He's taken a house on the cliff. I don't know the way by land, only by boat. It's like a small castle. Have you been there? Oh, yes, twice. My dad took me. We got to it by boat. There's a sort of cave behind a cove we landed at. Red met us there. I suppose there's a secret way from the cave to the house. <laughs> Must be. I'm ready to go when you are. We'll have to have a boat, though. We'll take George's. Anne stayed behind with Joan and watched the other three go off together. They hauled the boat down to the sea, jumped in and pulled away. Dick put up the sail as soon as they were well out to sea. The boat went on and on, scudding at times before a fairly strong wind. As they rounded a high cliff, Joe pointed in triumph to Red's place, a dour grey stone building with one square tower overlooking the waves. They took the sail down and rowed into a cove between two layers of rock that jutted out from the cliff. They dragged the boat up. Dick draped it with great armfuls of seaweed and soon it looked almost like a rock itself. Joe, who could climb like a monkey, got a rope from the boat tied it to something high up the cliff, and soon all three were standing on a ledge, looking into a curious-shaped cave. Joe led them into a narrow, rocky tunnel, and then out into a wider cave. Julian was thankful for his torch. He and Dick began to hunt round the cave, looking for a passage or little tunnel that led into the cliff, upwards towards the house. Joe stayed in a corner, waiting. Suddenly, the boys had a tremendous shock. A voice boomed in their cave, a loud and angry voice. Joe slipped behind a rock, and the boys stood rooted to the spot. So, you dare to come here? Who are you? Who are you? We've come to see a man called Red. Take us to him. Why do you want to see Red? 
Who said that? Nobody. We came because we want our cousin back. And her dog, too. There was another astonished silence. Then two legs appeared out of a hole in the low ceiling, and someone leapt lightly down beside them. Julian flashed his torch on the man. He was a giant-like fellow with flaming red hair. He had a red beard that partly hid a cruel mouth. Julian took one look into the man's eyes and thought, He's mad. So, you think I have your cousin? Who told you such a stupid tale? I'll tell you when the police come. The police? What do they know? There's a lot to know about you, Mr. Red Tower. Who sent men to steal my uncle's papers? Who kidnapped our cousin? Who brought her here from Simmy's old caravan? Ah, Who... how do you know all this? It isn't true. But the police, have they heard this fantastic tale too? What do you suppose? Julian wished with all his heart that the police did know. Red pulled at his beard. He suddenly called loudly up to the hole in the ceiling, and a short, burly man leapt down beside the boys. Marco, go down to the cove and smash the boat we saw these boys coming in. Then come back and take these boys to the yard. Tie them up. We must leave quickly and take the girl with us. How can we go? You know the helicopter is not ready? Make it ready then. We leave tonight. This boy knows everything, and the police must know everything too. What about the dog? Shoot it! Now go and smash the boat. And you, boy, you can tell your uncle if he wants his precious daughter back, he can send me the notes I want. When Markov came back, Red led the way up through the hole in the roof with the boys following. There had been no sign of Joe. They came to a flight of steps at the top of which was a stout door. Red pushed it open to reveal an enormous paved yard. In the middle stood a helicopter. The house, with its one tall square tower, was built round three sides of the yard. Julian felt himself seized and taken to a shed nearby. His arms were forced behind him and his wrists tied. Then the rope was run through an iron hoop and tied again. Julian glared at the burly fellow, now doing the same to Dick. Julian looked up at the tower and saw the small, forlorn face of George looking out of the window. Red had gone across the yard and disappeared through a stone archway and the sullen man now followed him. Julian and Dick were left by themselves. Suddenly, Julian heard an odd, Psst! He turned round sharply. Joe stood there. I'll oh, come and untie you. Is the coast clear? Joe, come on! There's a knife in my back pocket. Cut the ropes. I waited behind, then I followed when it was safe. Good old Joe. <sighs> Now you're both free. Where's George? Up in that tower. And there's poor old Tim, half doped, lying in that summer house place. I shan't let him be shot. I'll go and drag him down into the caves. Julian tried to stop her in case she was seen, but Joe had already darted over to the summer house. The slam of a door made the boys jump. It was red, coming across the yard. Dick and Julian quickly went and stood against the iron loops with their hands behind them, so when Red came to the door, it looked as if they were still tied. Red laughed, shut the door, and locked it. Joe left Timmy, sped back, and unlocked the door. Come out, and we'll lock it again. Hurry! Thanks, Joe. There's no way of getting George out of that tower. We can't even get to her. I'll get her out. How? If I can get into the room next to George's, I can undo her door and set her free. And how do you think you're going to get into the room next to hers? Climb up the ivy on the wall. You'd fall and be killed. We couldn't let you. Ha! I've climbed a wall without any ivy at all. Without another word, she bounded over the courtyard and came to the foot of the tower. 
Up the ivy Joe went, climbing steadily right up to the window next to George's, which was open at the bottom. She wriggled through the narrow gap and disappeared from sight. She tiptoed to the door and looked out. The door of George's room had a very large key in the lock and a great bolt. Joe leapt across, dragged at the bolt and turned the enormous key. She pushed open the door and looked in. George was there, thin and unhappy, sitting by the window. We've come to get you out. Joe, it can't really be you. It is. Come on. We must go before Red comes. Wait, there's someone coming. In here, quick. It's that redhead man, I expect. Listen, we look awfully alike. I'll let myself be caught, and you slip down to Dick and Julian. Red will never know I'm not you. I've even got some of your clothes on now. No, I don't want you to do that. You've got to. I can open the window and climb down the ivy when Red's gone. There was a loud exclamation when Red discovered the door of George's room open and nobody there. He yelled for Markov, who came up the steps two at a time. Red screamed at him in rage, but Markov was unmoved by his fury. He began searching the other rooms, and finally entered the room where the girls were hiding. At once, he saw the top of Joe's head showing behind the chair. He pounced on her and dragged her out, not realising it was not George. Joe was taken yelling and kicking into George's room and locked in. George stayed hidden while the two men argued outside. Then she heard Red ask Markov if he had shot the dog yet. George's heart went stone cold. Shoot Timmy? Oh no! She couldn't let him be shot. She heard Red and Markov go down the stone stairway and slipped down after them. They went into a room and George shot past the open door. Down she went until she came to a heavy door that opened onto the courtyard. She knew where Timmy was and that he had been doped, as she had been able to see him sometimes. She tore across the courtyard to the summer house and flung herself on him, calling his name. Timmy opened his eyes. He staggered to his feet somehow, but he couldn't walk. George looked round in desperation in case Markov was coming, but she saw somebody else, Julian, standing looking at her. She called to him to help her and in a trice he and Dick shot across the courtyard. The three of them managed to drag Timmy across the yard and down the steps into the caves. They all sat down in a heap together. George got as close to Timmy as she could, and then told them all that had happened to Joe. Up at the grey stone house, plenty was happening. Markov had gone to shoot Timmy, but when he got to the summer house, there was no dog there. He darted across to the locked shed, turned the key and opened the door. Nobody was there. He'd better find Red and tell him. He went in through the massive front door and in the hall came face to face with two men, Simmy and Jake. What are you doing here? You were told to keep a watch on Kirin Cottage. We've come to say that the cook woman called Joan went down to the police this morning. You're a bit late with your news. We hear the police are on their way. Clear off now. We want some money. You've only paid us half you promised. You can ask Red for it. Hmm? Where is he? Upstairs. Better let me find him and say what I've got to say. Follow me. Markov, what's wrong? The dogs and the two boys have escaped, and here are two visitors for you. They want money. You two, you dare to come here? You've been paid. You can't blackmail me. That's the girl. What's up with her? Jake, go and get her. Fetch it yourself. Markov produced a revolver, and not only Jake scuttled upstairs, but also Simmy. They unlocked the door, and Simmy stepped into the room to deal with the imprisoned girl. But he stopped dead and gaped. Hello, Dad. You do seem surprised to see me. Joe! Well, of all the... Joe! What's all this, Simmy? 
How do I know? Joe, where's the other kid? Hunt round and see if you can find her. Jake, bring that kid down! She's not here! What do you mean, saying she's not here? Are you mad? Oh, this isn't the scientist chap's daughter. This is Simmy's kid, Joe. Yes, I'm Joe. I'm not Georgina. She's gone. Red completely lost his temper. He had been deceived, and as this was Simmy's daughter, then it must be Simmy who had a hand in the deception. He went over to Simmy, eyes blazing, and struck him hard. Simmy was sent flying to the floor. Jake came up immediately to help him. He tripped up Red and leapt on him. Joe looked at the struggling men and ran to the door. She was just going down the stairs when an idea came into her sharp little mind. She pulled the door to quietly, turned the key in the lock and shot the bolt. The men inside heard the key turn and realised they'd been locked in. They yelled for Markov, who rushed up the stairs. Joe was hiding in the next room. As soon as Markov went to the door and shot back the bolt, she slipped out and was down the spiral staircase in a trice, hugging the big key to her thin little chest. Red yelled to Markov to unlock the door. Markov yelled back that the key had gone and that he would go and find Joe. Markov raged through every room but she was nowhere to be seen. Joe had made her way to the kitchen, found the larder and locked herself in. Then she tucked in. She remembered the others and filled a rush bag she found, first putting the big key at the bottom. Joe unlocked the door very cautiously. There was an old woman in the kitchen, but Joe was out of the room before she could get out a word. Joe felt sure the others must be down in the caves. Keeping to the wall, she sidled like a weasel to the door that led underground. Julian, Dick and George were sitting crouched together with Timmy in the centre. Timmy growled. A thing he hadn't done at all so far. A voice came to them. Julian, Dick, where are you? I've lost my way. It's Joe. How did you escape? What's happened? Heaps. Have a sausage roll. What? Here's the basket. Help yourselves. Joe, you're the eighth wonder of the world. Hello. What's this key? I locked Red and Jake and Simmy into that tower room. That's the key. What do you think of that? Joe, I think you're a marvel. She is. You trust me now, don't you? Of course. You're our friend forever. Not George's. Oh, yes, you are. You're as good as a boy. It's getting on towards evening. I wonder what those fellows are doing. Three of them were still locked up. Markov, outside with the other two men he had brought up to help, was getting very worried. Red called to him to take the men and go and look for the children in the caves, the only place for them to hide. The children heard the men coming, and hurriedly swung themselves down through the hole into the cave below, overlooking the steep cliff. Halfway up the wall of the cave was a shelf of rock. Julian hoisted George up with Timmy, then joined her with Dick. Jo lay down in a hole by the wall and covered herself with sand. As it happened, Jo was the only one to be discovered, quite by accident. Markov trod on her hand. This is the one we want. She's got the key. Give it to me. All right. Let me go. Here's the key. Now you can stay down here with the others. We're going to roll a rock over the hole in the roof. You'll be prisoners. Come on, let's go. That's done it. We'll never move that rock. It's a pity poor Joe was found. Now Red and the others will go free. They won't. I got the food from the kitchen larder. And when I came out, I took the key. That's the one I gave them. So you've still got the right key with you? Yes. And Red, me dad and Jake are still locked up. When they find they've got the wrong key, they'll be down here again. Let's get out of here. Climb down the cliff to the sea. 
Luckily, the rope they'd used when they arrived was still in place. George, Julian and Dick climbed down it. Then Joe hauled it up and tied poor old sleepy Timmy to it and lowered him down. Joe, without a look at the rope, climbed down like a monkey. Julian divided up the party and they each went off to see if they could find a hiding place. Suddenly, there was an excited shriek from George. It. He couldn't find it and told Red a lie. You wait till we get you! Quick! He's coming down the rope. Pull the boat down to the water. Oh, Demi! He's fallen off the ledge into the water. He's too doped to swim. He'll drown. But the sudden coldness of the sea had washed away all his dopiness. Timmy was himself again. As the children got the boat into the water and clambered in, Timmy tore over to the cliff, barking madly, and jumping up at Markov, suspended from the rope. Markov was terrified and desperately started climbing up again. George yelled to Timmy to come to the boat, and at last, regretfully, he did. With Julian and Dick rowing hard, the boat shot out of the cove to sea. It was getting dark as George's boat came into Kirin Bay. Anne was waiting for them on the beach, almost crying with joy to have them all home again. Joan screamed with relief when she saw George, and as she bustled about getting them a meal, told them she had been to the police. As she was speaking, the telephone rang, and it was the police on the line, very pleased to learn that the children were back safely. Ten minutes later, they were at the house, hearing the children's story. Will my father go to prison, Sergeant? I'm afraid so. I don't mind. I'm better off when he's away. We'll see if we can fix you up with a nice home. I've got a cousin who'd like a ragamuffin like you. Now, don't you fret. We'll look after you. I wouldn't mind living with someone like you. I'd like to see Dick and all of you sometimes, though. You will if you're good. Oh, Sergeant, I nearly forgot. Here's the key to the tower room. Won't they get a shock when you unlock the door and walk in? <laughs> Quite a lot of people are going to get shocks. By the way, Georgie, eh? We got in touch with a friend of your father's. He says your father gave him all his important American papers before he went. So Red hasn't anything of value. Now, I'll uh, just use your telephone, if I may, and set things going. Things were certainly set going that night. Cars roared up to Red's house and the gate broken in. The helicopter was lying on its side, smashed. Markov and two men had tried to set off in it, and it had risen some way, then fallen back to the yard. Red, Simi and Jake were still locked up and were mad with rage. It wasn't long before all six of them were safely tucked away in police cars. At the cottage, everyone was getting ready for bed when the telephone rang. Julian answered... It was the telegram office with a cable for them from Spain. Reply paid. The message read, Here is our address. Please cable back saying if everything all right. Uncle Quentin. What reply shall I give? No good upsetting them now that everything is over. Not a bit of good. Say what you like. Right. Hello, operator. Here is the reply. Having a most exciting time with lots of fun and games. Everything okay, Julian. Everything okay. That's what I like to hear at the end of an adventure. Everything okay. Okay.